Hello everyone, I am Sayed Nakhvi. I am a PhD student at the Astronomical Observatory of the Jagiellonian University. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present uh, this uh, work on freely falling bodies in standing wave space-time. So we all know that in the mechanical setting as well as in the electromagnetic setting, there are standing waves, right? They form anti-nodes and nodes. The idea uh, is that are there standing gravitational waves and more specifically, are there exact solutions to Einstein field equations which can represent standing gravitational waves? And then to study how particles or how geodesics in such a space-time would behave. So this uh, talk would basically uh, be uh, centered around these two themes that how to motivate standing gravitational waves and second if there are some freely falling observers immersed in such a space-time then how will they see things around them. So we know that obviously gravitational waves were studied as the in the linear theory as well as exact solutions where the gravitational wave nature is inbuilt in the metric itself. So very early it was Bondi who studied the uh, who tried to study standing gravitational waves from an unsymmetric body, but he was studying it in a linear regime and if non-linearities were taken into account, then it, the studies were a bit complicated. Then almost a decade ago, it was Hans Stephanie who postulated this question that are there standing gravitational wave solutions of the vacuum Einstein equations? And his idea was that you look for exact solutions which have some a specific form of the metric that the consecutive part should be should have a periodic factor or there might should be an analog of pointing vector. But the issue was that such a method was not covariant. So how to define standing uh, gravitational waves? So obviously you would have some nodes and anti-node formation. So standing wave may imply that there is an alternating energy flow through the nodes which averages out to zero. But since energy of gravitational waves cannot be localized, you need a covariant averaging procedure. It turns out in this paper that at the, if you consider the high frequency limit, you can capture the dominant contribution of the average energy flow and then your space time will contain standing gravitational waves if it belongs to one parameter family of space times satisfying the green wall assumptions and second that the Ricci tensor of the background metric is of a search time if of, is of search type and such is the space time which we studied which is officially known as the t3 Gaudi model so this uh, this space time represents an expanding universe where there are gravitational waves of arbitrary uh, wavelength and they are interacting with each other with each other and forming standing gravitational waves so here the the wave uh, is in the z direction which uh, the, and the z coordinate goes from 0 to 2 pi t represents the cosmic time x and y are also periodic which goes from 0 to 2 pi and the main protagonists are these functions f and p which are functions of uh, t and z when you solve the einstein equations you get the form of this p and f and in this, there are two important parameters. One is beta, which controls the amplitude of the standing gravitational waves. And second is lambda, which controls the number of waves there are. Now for this space time, the topology is a donut, but it's sort of a higher dimensional donut. So uh, a donut, which we generally eat is two, uh, is, a, is a two torus, right? You take a square tile and you join the opposite sides like this GIF over here. But this space time, it represents a polarized three torus. So you have to imagine that you take a cube and you join the opposite sides. So one gravitation wave is traveling in this direction. One will come behind me, let's say, and it will interact and form standing gravitational waves. And the idea is that when this standing gravitational wave will form the nodes and the antinodes, we study how geodesics will behave. So first we study the trajectories of uh, test particles via the geodesic equation. So you imagine that there is uh, a flag space time where obviously if there is a flag space time the geodesics will remain parallel forever. But now if you switch on this Gaudi space time, what you will see is that the geodesics are getting concentrated at these at these antidotes. Now, intuitively, you can think of that if there is a standing gravitation wave, there would be some accumulation of energy at the antinode. So the geodesic should get attracted at this point. So this actually agrees very well with our intuitive picture, which we have plotted here like Z versus proper time, that the geodesics are attracted at the antinodes. And now at the antinodes is where we imagine that there is a freely falling observer and he or she is observing a ring of test masses around him or her. 
via the geodesic deviation equation. So we study the geodesic deviation equation in X and Y. So the gra standing gravitational wave is in the Z direction and you are freely falling at the antinode. And when, when you are freely falling, you observe a ring of test masses. So these are two test uh, ring masses which are of different initial conditions and after a full gravitational wave form you see a permanent ellipsoid uh, uh, ellipsoid shape over here. So this actually sim symbolizes the gravitational wave memory, which is essentially a permanent displacement or velocity left behind after a gravitational wave has passed. Because usually what we see is that, okay, initial ring of particles stays same after a gravitational wave has passed. But in principle, there is some residual displacement or velocity left, which is termed as gravitational wave memory, and which we found out in this space time, which has just standing gravitational waves. And this was, uh, the calculations were very intuitive uh, obviously when first done with hand uh, by using the curvature one and two forms but then they were matched uh, very well by the X tensor uh, exact package which of which we had a very good tutorial yesterday and we also use this uh, package to calculate the null tet uh, the uh, the Newman Penrose formalism the wild scalars for our space time so we did the Newman Penrose formalism for our space time which is this and our standing gravitational waves can be thought of as a non-trivial superposition of two waves moving in the opposite spatial directions so what do we what did we find out that amongst the wild scalars the psi 2 which is the coulomb part is not zero the longitudinal part of weil scalar is zero and the transverse part is not zero what this physically means that if you are in this space time the gaudi t3 model and if you are at the antinode and if there is a sphere of test masses over here it will get permanently uh, deformed into an ellipsoid and if you uh, if you observe a ring of test masses in the uh, in the xy direction it will get deformed into an ellipse signifying the memory effect so in, uh, in uh, conclusion, we studied an exact solution which actually gave us a glimpse into the nonlinear effects of general relativity because uh, what we found out that particles are getting attracted at the antinodes. You get a permanent deformation of the test masses which, is, which we termed as the memory and also that because you are superimposing two uh, gravitational waves and you are studying full exact solution. So the longitudinal effect which we get is due to the Coulomb part of the while, not due to the longitudinal part of the while scalar. In future work, we would like to study uh, how uh, electromagnetic standing waves are coupled to gravity and how test masses would behave in such a space time. Obviously, uh, for this space time which we studied is actually a toy model, but it gives you a bit of glimpse into what the nonlinear effects might be when you are studying standing gravitational waves. There might, there might be attraction of particles at the antinode, there might be memory effect, there would be longitudinal effects which would be due to some, uh, due to some part of the Y. So, I end here.